Today we reach an important uh, point in our journey through this series, Back to the Basics. Today we are going back to the basics, the gospel. Now what is the gospel? We're talking in this series about the elementary principles in this series, the, the fundamental aspects of our faith, and in its most plain, fundamental, elementary understanding, the word gospel simply means good news. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. And the verb form, stick with me here because it's important, the verb form of that, uangelizo, means to bring or announce good news. That's why when we reach out and we share the good news with someone, sometimes we call it, look at the word, to evangelize. Uangelize, evangelize. And what is that? That's bringing the good news to someone. Do you see that there? And in classic Greek, get this, an uangelos was one, a person who brought a message of victory or personal news that caused joy. You see, this term was around long before Jesus, and that's what it meant. It was someone who brought a message of victory or personal joy, like an evangelist. So the gospel is good news, and it is truly a good news message of victory and personal joy. Joy. The truth is, we've already talked about the word or the, the concept of gospel in this series. And in all the subjects that we've covered thus far, the gospel has been revealed. Let me show you. We have said that God is superior to all else. And that He created mankind. And because of Satan's fall and subsequent temptation of man, sin entered the world. And we all sin. We have all offended God's high and holy standard. And the wages of sin is death. And the punishment for sin is the lake of fire, or as we know it, hell. Now that sure doesn't seem like good news, does it? But good news, in order to be really good, must be set up beside the bad news. The good news is, God has made a way of escape or rescue. And that through the person of Jesus who came to deliver, to rescue, and to save. To rescue us from evil and the power of the evil one. To deliver us from destruction and save us from the lake of fire and the coming wrath of God. And so be resurrected from the dead as Jesus was as the first fruits. That we might live an everlasting life in paradise or heaven on earth. That's good news. That's the gospel. In a sense, the whole of God's word is the gospel. But more specifically, it is about the work of Jesus Christ to bring salvation to the world through his death and burial and resurrection. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, this morning to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 12.22. And, thank you. 12.22 in those Red Pew Bibles. Pretty soon we're going to start the service with the page number. You guys are getting so quick on this. That's awesome. All right. 12.22 in the Red Pew Bibles, if you didn't bring your own. If you did bring your own, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. We'll start reading in verse 1, and we'll work through it as we read. We're talking about a good news message of victory and personal joy. 
the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I would remind you, and that's what I want to do this morning. He's reminding them, why? Because they've already heard it. And we'll see in a minute, they've already received it. But what's Paul doing here? He's going back, isn't he? To something he's already told them, something they've already understand, going back to the basics. And that's what we're doing with you today. We're reminding you of the basics. I want to remind you, brothers, see, they're already in the faith, or sisters, is that what that word can mean? It's kind of gender neutral, of the gospel. I want to remind you of the gospel, that is, the good news. And I want you to notice the progression of this good news message of victory and personal joy. He said, this is the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Now, did you notice the progression there? He said, in the past, you've already received it. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, you received it. Past. And now, what is the present? In which you stand. We stand in the good news message of Jesus Christ now. And then, over here, by which you are being saved. Future connotation. When all that the gospel purchases us for us is realized. So he says, this gospel I preached to which you stand, being saved, if, there's one of those troublesome conditional transitions, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. If you hold fast, that means if you stand in the gospel uncompromising, and unadulterated by falsehood, if you stand here, then you are in a good, good news spot. But then he says, if not, by extension, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice the phrase first importance when we're talking about the gospel. The gospel should be of first importance in the church of the living God. There is nothing more important than this message. Why do you hear it so often here? Because there's nothing more important than the gospel message. The word first importance there, it's actually just one, protois, and it means leading or chief or first. This is the leading chief first message that should be in God's church. And so that is where we find and proclaim the importance of keeping this message first, of preeminence. You remember we talked about God being first, preeminent, over and above all? That message of the gospel is in His church. And if the gospel is not heard in a church, and it focuses simply on social issues, or the causes of the day, or any particular doctrines that define the church, then it has mistakenly replaced that which is of first importance. Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. It didn't originate with the Apostle Paul. Somebody gave it to him, and he passed it along. I preached it to you, but only after it was preached to me. I delivered this to you, what I received. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. The fact that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, is not only attested in the Scriptures, but His death is attested many other places as well. Even non-Christian sources attest to the death of Jesus Christ. The Jewish historian Josephus, 
the Roman historian Tacitus, the Samaritan-born historian Thallus, all attest to the historicity of the event of Jesus dying on a Roman cross in first century. But everyone dies in this world, so what's the big deal? What separated Jesus' death from all of humanity is that He died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. We've talked about sin. we talked about sin's result, that it brings death, and it brings punishment, and it brings God's wrath. And we in no way could rid ourselves of that guilt. But God came in the flesh to die accepting as Jesus, the Lamb of God, the wrath from God in our place. And it was according to the Scriptures, Paul says. Now what Scriptures is he talking about that would talk about him dying for our sins? Well, if you look at this Scripture from Isaiah chapter 53, 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, Wounds, we are healed. He died for our sins according to the scriptures, even those 700 years before he came to this earth. And then Paul continues back in 1 Corinthians 15 after dying for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried. Why is the burial important as a part of the gospel message? It's because it validates his death. Only dead people are buried, and he was buried. But it also validates his resurrection, because only dead people raised from the dead. And his burial validates not only his death, but the fact that he raised from the dead. And that's the next part of the gospel. It says, and that, in verse 4, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Some say that the Old Testament has very little to say about the resurrection of the dead, and that's kind of true. And so they say, well, folks in that day really wouldn't have, from the Scriptures, understood the whole resurrection Jesus was talking about. But I bet you in hindsight they did. For instance, do you think this passage from Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 came alive in their minds after that? After two days He will revive us, and on the third day He will raise us up, that we may live before Him. In accordance with the Scriptures, Jesus was raised from the dead. And the resurrection is crucial to the cross. You hear me? The resurrection is crucial to the cross because it completes the good news. That's why Paul takes time to address an encroaching falsehood in the church down in 1 Corinthians 15. Jump down to verses 12 and following where he's saying, now listen, because of this gospel I delivered to you as of first importance, now if, verse 12, Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, which I'm doing to you now. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And... We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Why? Because we testified that God raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it's true the dead are not raised. So you can see Paul is saying, look, when it comes to the good news message that brings 
a message of victory and personal joy, the resurrection is crucial to the crucifixion. Otherwise, our faith is meaningless. And that is the gospel. That he died, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and back in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, the apostles, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time as proof, most of whom are still alive, just in case you want to go talk to them and check it out, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's the Lord's biological brother, then to all the apostles, all those little apostles, all those who have been sent. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me, the apostle Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy even to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am today. And His grace toward me was not in vain. Not in vain, why? One, because Christ really has been raised. And two, because He is holding fast to this which He is delivering to them again. The gospel message. I want to share with you just briefly, not in my sermon, what one of our elders wrote this weekend in our text group, if you will, to kind of keep on top of y'all. From one of your church elders, I look at all my Christian brothers and sisters and I think they love Jesus, but they see what the world is turning into and their go-to reaction is to respond primarily through political or militant means. What upsets me is that they're subordinating the gospel to political activism. They seem to think that the gospel is weak and isn't efficient for the day. The gospel isn't weak. The church is. It's the gospel that will transform our land. It's the gospel that is changing hearts in Islam, in Asia, in the world. If only our brothers and sisters in Christ would make proclaiming the gospel their immediate and natural reaction to this mess we're in. Amen. Couldn't have said it better, so I read it. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter. In this letter, 1 Corinthians, you can see it up here in chapter 2. Paul says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you proclaiming a testimony of God with lofty speech or with wisdom, but I decided to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. There is nothing of greater importance in the church of God because, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And the New Testament is overflowing with references to the gospel. If you go through your New Testament and scan it, you'll find over 100 references to the gospel. Jesus Himself declared it. You can see it here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The Gospel. The writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John ended with the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ in their Gospels. 
In Acts chapter 2, it says, the message never changing, this Jesus delivered up to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The gospel. In Romans, we're not ashamed of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians, the simple gospel is enough. In 2 Corinthians, the gospel can be veiled by the enemy. In Galatians, we stick to the story and don't manipulate the gospel. In Ephesians, we have heard and believed the gospel of our salvation. In Philippians, we are partnered defending and advancing the gospel. In Colossians, the gospel is spreading. In 1 Thessalonians, the gospel is power that brings conviction. In 2 Thessalonians, the gospel gains for us glory, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy, sound doctrine originates from the gospel. In 2 Timothy, life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel. In Philemon, the gospel is worthy to be imprisoned for. In 1 Peter, the gospel is even proclaimed to the dead. In Revelation, the gospel is eternal and proclaimed to every nation and tribe and language and people. But the gospel of Jesus Christ means nothing to a person unless it is obeyed. And that's strange language to us. Obey. Obey the gospel. But it's not strange language to Peter. And it's not strange language to Paul. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 17, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, he wrote a vengeance coming on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You see the terms in there? Obey the gospel. What does that mean? What's it mean to obey the gospel? First of all, I believe it means to believe it. How do we obey the gospel? We believe it. You're in 1 Corinthians 15, hopefully, still. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Paul said, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of those other apostles whom he's referring to, though it was not I, it was the grace of God in me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you have believed. Faith comes by hearing, so we preached, and hearing by the Word of God. We preach the gospel to you, you heard it, and you have what? You've believed it. To obey the gospel is to believe the good news message, to have faith in it. We're going to talk in a couple weeks about what faith, what belief really is. Back to the basics, faith. But for today, understand that to obey the gospel is to believe what we've said about the gospel today. Amen. Secondly, is to identify with it. How do we obey the gospel? I believe it's we identify with it. That's what Ray said in his testimony, if you heard him. I identify with what? The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Back in Romans chapter 6. You look at it, just it's one book back, so start flipping back. Romans chapter 6, look at it with me, starting in verse 1. We believe it. We identify with it. How do we do that? We experience our own gospel. 
We identify with the gospel, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul just talked about grace in 1 Corinthians. Guess what? We're going to go back to the basics grace next week. Next week. By no means shall we keep on sinning, verse 2. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? Death. His death. His death. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that, what? Just as Christ was raised from the dead... By the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if, there's another one of those conditional terms that gets up there and kind of needles us. If we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We identify with the gospel, portraying our own death and burial, and resurrection. And then thirdly, how do we obey the gospel? We live it. We live it. Back to Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, hold fast to the word that I preach to you. Hold fast to it. Live it. You know, every day we live the gospel by denying ourselves and picking up our crosses and following Him. Every day we live the gospel by allowing the Spirit of God to live in and through us. Every day we obey the gospel when the Savior appears to the world again and again and again through us and in us. We live it. We live the gospel. And that is the obedience that Paul is talking about. So have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you come to believe this good news message of what Jesus accomplished on your behalf? Have you identified with it in your own death and burial and resurrection? And have you begun to live it? Live the gospel of Jesus Christ where His resurrection power is shown in your life every day. It is, church, a good news message of victory Amen. that will bring personal joy to your life that was heretofore unimagined. Amen. I can promise you. Let's pray.